Hey guys, Michael here, co-founder of Studicata. In today's video, I just wanna briefly go over the most tested rules and evidence, at least if you're sitting for the uniform bar exam and taking the multi-state essay exam. These are going to be your must know rules and evidence. Before I jump into that, just want to quickly mention that if you have more interest in learning about the most frequently tested rules from each subject of the bar exam, highly recommend that you check out our top 120 list. It took us over a thousand hours to compile that project for you guys, and you can download it right now for free. There's a link in the description if you want to learn more. Okay, but in today's video, just want to focus on evidence. So what are the most tested rules in evidence? Over the last 20 plus years, consistently the most tested rules have been relevance, character evidence, and hearsay. Those are gonna be your big three must know rules and evidence. Okay, so let's take a step back and think about evidence from, from the big picture, All right? Evidence is unique in the sense that I can tell you right now what you're going to be looking at when you take your evidence essay on the multi-state essay exam, if it is indeed tested. Um, the, as, the evidence question is, always formatted the same way. Um, what you're gonna have is obviously your fact pattern, but your call to the question is gonna be a little bit different than most calls to the question. It's gonna be a little bit longer, a little bit more detailed, which for most of you is good news. Um, it's gonna be very direct and tell you exactly what you're looking for. On the, on the call to the question in your evidence section, it's going to give you four, five, maybe six pieces of evidence, and it's gonna ask you to determine whether each piece of evidence is admissible or inadmissible. It's gonna ask you to play judge and look at different pieces of evidence and determine whether or not it can be admitted into court. I like to think of this as hurdles at a track meet, right? This is how I describe evidence in the big picture to students who are just being introduced to evidence. What you should think about it as, if you've ever been to a high school track meet or if you watch the Summer Olympics and you see hurdlers, what happens is obviously there's a track and there's normally eight lanes and you have the runners line up, they blow the horn or the gun, whatever it is, and your runners start to run around. But what's different about hurdles is they have these barriers on the track and the sprinters, the runners, have to jump over each of these hurdles as they make their loop around the track until eventually they get to the end, cross the finish line, whoever finishes first, whatever, that's the winner. So how is this like evidence? Imagine that each one of those runners is a different piece of evidence. And imagine that the hurdles are your federal rules of evidence. And imagine that crossing the finish line is the equivalent of being admitted into court. That's what an analysis on a evidence essay exam is going to look like. You have all these pieces of evidence running around the circle and they're trying to get over all of these hurdles. And along the way, a lot of these hurdles, the federal rules of evidence, are gonna knock pieces of evidence out and they're not gonna make it to the finish line. They're not gonna make it over every hurdle that they have to, to be admitted into court, to cross that finish line and be admitted. Um, and that's obviously the goal for any piece of evidence. It wants to make it around each hurdle so that it can get admitted. Okay, so, and, and depending on what piece of evidence, the type of evidence, there's gonna be different hurdles, different steps that they have to overcome in order to be admitted. But one hurdle is pretty universal for every piece of evidence, and it's almost always an issue, and that's why it's one of the most tested rules, and that is relevance. Relevance is always gonna be one of your most tested rules, and in fact, on your essay exam, you should almost always be discussing relevance for every piece of evidence. It's always going to be your first hurdle that a piece of evidence has to overcome in order to be admitted. So what is relevance. Um, pretty easy analysis, actually. Most of the time, it's going to be very short and to the point. And remember, you're doing this for each piece of evidence. The bar examiners, I don't know why, they always want to see that you at least recognize that you first have to establish that each piece of evidence is relevant before you talk about different hurdles, different rules. So for relevance, to determine whether or not a piece of evidence is relevant, you have to determine whether it is probative and material. Two elements to be relevant. So what does it mean to be probative? If evidence has any tendency to make a fact more or less probable, it is probative. Next, you have material. If that fact 
is of consequence in determining the outcome of the action, then it is material. Okay, so let's use an example here to illustrate that. Um, so imagine that we have a typical breach of contract action, run of the mill breach of contract. And the defense, the defendant wants to prove that the contract was written in blue ink. That's what the defendant wants to do. So to accomplish this, the defense calls a witness to take the stand at trial. And so this is a secretary that was there during the formation of the contract. And they ask this witness well, on the stand, the defense does, what color was the contract written in? And she says, blue. The contract was written in blue ink. Defense asks, how do you know that the contract was written in blue ink? And she says, it was raining that day. Okay, let's think about this. She says that the contract was written in blue ink because it was raining that day. Is this probative? Does her testimony that it was raining that day have any tendency to prove that the contract was written in blue ink? Does it have any tendency to prove that the fact that the contract was written in blue ink is more or less probable? It does not, right? That is not probative. That would be objected to and the judge would throw that out. There's no probative value there. The fact that it was raining that day doesn't have any tendency to prove whether or not the contract was written in blue ink. That fact, whether the contract was written in blue ink, does not become more or less probable based on whether it was raining that day. There's no connection between those two things, so it has no probative value, gets thrown out. Objection sustained. So the defense tries again. Defense asks the witness again, what color was the contract written in? Same answer. She says it was written in blue ink. Asked, how do you know this? This time she says, I was there. I saw it with my own eyes. I remembered that the contract is written in blue ink. Now is her answer probative? Yes. Eyewitness testimony is almost always going to be probative. The fact becomes more probable now, the fact that the contract was written in blue ink becomes more probable from her testimony that she saw with her own eyes that the contract was written in blue ink. That is probative. So the next question is, is it material? Do we care whether the contract was written in blue ink? Is that a fact that is of consequence in determining the outcome of the action? I don't know about you guys, but from my understanding of Article 2 of the Uniform Commercial Code, all the common law and case law I've ever read about contracts, I've never seen that the color that the contract is written in would affect the outcome of whether or not it was a valid enforceable agreement. Um, so the fact that she's saying that the contract was written in blue ink is not of consequence in determining the outcome of the action. We don't care if the contract is written in blue ink, red ink, yellow ink, green ink, doesn't matter. So in that sense, it might be probative, but now it's not material. So it's still not relevant. So remember, relevance, you need probative and material. And of course we could change that fact pattern, right? You could always change facts and make the color of the contract probative and material. I'm sure there's a way that you could rearrange the facts to do that. But in the, the typical run-of-the-mill breach of contract case, the color of the ink the contract was written in is usually not going to be of consequence in determining the outcome of the action. So that is relevance. And remember, the key with relevance that you have to remember is you're going to want to talk about that for every single piece of evidence. And remember, in your call of the question, they're going to give you four, five, maybe six different pieces of evidence. And it's going to be repetitive, but it's good form to do it to make sure that you're racking up your points for each piece of evidence. You need to say, this is relevant because it's probative and material because, right? You need to run through each one and talk about whether it's probative and material. And a quick hint to you all, nine times out of 10, it's going to be relevant. And it, to be probative, right, the threshold is 1%. To be material, it's 1%. If there's any tendency, any tendency, that, it, that the evidence makes the fact more or less probable, even 1%, you know, a 1% usefulness, you can think of the utility of the evidence, even if it's 1% useful in proving a fact to be true, then it's considered probative. Same with material. If it has any tendency, you know, to be of consequence 
and determining the outcome of the action, even if it's the smallest little bit, it's going to be considered material. So it's a very low threshold when you're determining relevance, which is why most of the time you're probably going to find that evidence is indeed relevant. So getting over that first hurdle is relatively easy for most pieces of evidence. And that is, again, what you're going to want to do for each piece of evidence. Okay, that's enough about relevance. Pretty straightforward. So related to relevance is the idea of character evidence, which just so happens to be another one of the top three most tested rules in evidence. And character evidence is a little bit tricky, right? This is a big decision tree. And I will at some point make this decision tree for you like I did for contracts and put that link in the description so you can see it there because talking it out is always harder than um, when you can see it visually because it, uh, the nature of character evidence as an analysis is just such a decision tree that can go in different directions depending on the facts that you're given. Um, but just to overview character evidence, right? So what is the point of character evidence? Why do we have this? In a way, it's related to relevance. You know, how probative is character evidence really? How material is character evidence really? You know, how, what is the value of somebody's character trait in determining the outcome of an action? You know, does the fact that someone's a violent person or a dishonest person or a good person or a bad person have any tendency to prove that certain facts are either more or less probable? You know, that's what character evidence is trying to grapple with. This idea of, you know, how probative and relevant is it really? And does the danger of unfair prejudice really outweigh that? Um, is what courts have grappled with over time with character evidence. Um, and the reason that we have rules regarding character evidence is because it's all about prejudice to the jury. We don't want juries to base verdicts on character traits, right? We want them to analyze most of the time as a general rule. As a general rule, we want juries to base their verdicts on the facts and evidence that's directly related to the case at hand. We, it's a slippery slope if you start to allow a lot of character evidence to come in, right? It's easy to prejudice and inflame a jury when you start talking about the type of character a person has, right? And that is why all of the rules of character evidence have been developed around this idea and you can imagine a situation imagine if we had no character evidence rules right anytime somebody was on trial for anything criminal civil imagine though a criminal case I mean, imagine how out of hand it could get if the prosecution was able to bring in any type of character evidence they wanted whenever they wanted right anytime any defendant was on trial for anything the prosecution would just look into their past find every little tiny thing that they've ever done wrong and start just piling it on at trial. And then by the end of it, the jury would just, you know, he has no chance. You're just going to prejudice the jury so much with things that could possibly be totally irrelevant to the case at hand, which is why it's kind of a relevance issue as a whole. But aside from all of the theory of character evidence and mumbo jumbo, and I was like, just tell me what I need to know, man, to pass the bar exam if evidence is tested. So what you need to know primarily about character evidence. And I can't, I'm not gonna go into all the black letter law here, but to approach a character evidence essay, when you spot that character evidence is likely an issue, you need to ask yourself three questions. First, you need to ask yourself, what is the type of character evidence being presented? Am I dealing with opinion testimony, reputation in the community testimony, or am I dealing with a specific instance of conduct? That's your first thing that you have to establish. The next question is going to be, is this being introduced to show propensity or is it being introduced for some other reason? It's gonna be question number two. Question number three that you just need to be cognizant of, is this a civil case or a criminal case? Because similar to contracts with UCC versus common law, the rules are gonna be a little bit different if you're dealing with a civil case versus a criminal case. So this is your big picture starting point. That's, that's the flow of an analysis. Those are the three questions that you need to think about. So let's go back and talk about those a little bit more. So your first question is what type of character evidence is being presented? Um, so again, you have opinion testimony, reputation testimony, and specific instances of conduct. So opinion testimony would be a witness getting on the stand and saying, in my opinion, I think Johnny is a violent person. 
you know, it's just my opinion of him. I've known him for some time. I just think, in my opinion, he's violent. That's opinion testimony. Reputation testimony would be witness on the stance as everyone knows that Johnny's violent, right? He's had that reputation since we've been kids in the community. Everyone knows he's violent. That's reputation testimony. And then you have specific instances of conduct. That would be like a witness on the stand saying, I saw Johnny get into a bar fight last weekend, right? A specific instance of conduct. So those are your three types. And the rules regarding character evidence, the admissibility of character evidence will change slightly based on what type of evidence you're dealing with. So you need to identify, is this, is this reputation and opinion testimony or is this a specific instance of conduct? Once you establish that in your head, as you're outlining your answer, the next thing that you need to think about is propensity, right? And this is the big one. This is where I see lots of mistakes happen. So want to say this very carefully because this is important. So when you're determining whether character evidence is being offered for propensity purposes, you have to ask yourself, why is whoever's introducing this, right? It could be the plaintiff, prosecution, or the defendant. Why is this being introduced? Is this being introduced to show that the defendant has the propensity to commit the crime in question or the wrongdoing in question, or is it being admitted for some other reason? So let's just think about criminal cases first, because that's, that's a little bit easier to visualize, I think. Um, so in a criminal case, if I'm going to introduce character evidence, right, am I introducing this evidence? And say it's an evidence of a violence character trait, right? And, and say that the criminal defendant is on trial for murder, some violent crime. Am I introducing this evidence to show that because this defendant is a violent person, he has the propensity to commit murder? If that's what I'm doing, there's going to be a lot of rules regarding how I can do that. And it's generally inadmissible. It's generally, even in civil and criminal cases, admitting the general starting point rule is introducing character evidence for propensity purposes is inadmissible. We think that's just going to prejudice the jury too much. So the starting point rule is it's inadmissible. You can't, for a murder suspect that's on trial, you can't say because he is violent. Generally, you can't say because he is violent, he has the propensity to commit murder. That's not allowed. But the but the, the exception here where a lot of people mix this up is if it's not being introduced for propensity purposes, and this is where MIMIC comes in. If you remember from law school, you probably heard this acronym, MIMIC, which stands for motive or opportunity, intent, absence of mistake, identity, common plan or scheme. If you're introducing character evidence to show any of those things, you're not introducing it to show that the defendant has the propensity to commit the crime in question. You're offering it to show motive or opportunity or intent or identity or a common plan or scheme or absence of mistake, any of the mimic reasons, then it's going to be admissible. Generally, it's going to be admissible. As long as you can prove that specific instance by a preponderance of the evidence, and if you can show that the probative value of it substantially outweighs the danger of unfair prejudice to the jury, then you're allowed to bring that in to show motive or opportunity or any of those mimic rules, right? So the example there would be, while you can't bring in evidence of a violent character trait to show propensity to commit the crime, Say that we have, say same, we'll stick with the same example. So we have somebody on trial for murder. Say it's on trial for murdering their spouse. So the prosecution wants to bring evidence that this, that this defendant was having an affair, that he was cheating on his spouse. And so his plan was to murder his spouse so he could run off with this new woman that he's having an affair with. This is, their, this is their motive for the case. He wanted to get rid of his wife so he could run off with his new affair woman, right? Um, can they introduce evidence of the affair, which is a specific instance of conduct, 
to show his motive or to show his plan? And the answer is maybe yes, right? The judge will have to look at that and say, can first, can they prove this affair by a preponderance of the evidence? Second, does the probative value of this affair um, out substantially outweigh the danger of unfair prejudice to the jury? And if he finds that indeed that they can prove the affair by a preponderance of the evidence and that there's not that risk of prejudice to the jury, then it can come in because they're not introducing it for propensity purposes. They're not saying because he's a cheater, because he's a liar, because he's a scumbag person, because he's having an affair, that means he has the propensity to commit murder. They're not saying that. They're not saying because he's a bad person, because of this character trait, he has the propensity to commit murder. The prosecution is saying because of this affair, he now has a motive to kill his wife. And you have to recognize that distinction um, because generally that's going to be admissible. Again, as long as you show preponderance of the evidence and you know it's not substantially uh, you know, and unfairly prejudicing the jury. If the probative value outweighs that risk of prejudice to the jury, then it can come in. Um, so that's the main thing with character evidence that you have to think about, which is why I said that's your second question, right? Are we dealing, number one, what type of character evidence is this? Because the rules are gonna change a little bit depending on what type it is. Number two, and the big one is, is this being introduced for propensity or for some other reason? Because if it's being introduced for some other reason than propensity, then it's generally allowed. You know, you don't have to go through the whole character evidence analysis that you might have to go through if it's being introduced for propensity purposes. Because remember, if it's being introduced for propensity purposes, it's generally inadmissible. Okay, and, and again, the character evidence analysis is such a decision tree that I think it's actually going to be better for you if I illustrate that with the document that you can download. So I'll get on that and put that in the uh, description, a link to that, so you can see really how the analysis would flow from those three questions. Because it's going to change so much, I don't think it would be good for me to sit up here and try and talk you through it. I think you really need to see it. So I'll go ahead and do that after I post this and try and get that up soon so you guys have that to reference. But that is, in a nutshell, the main things to remember with character evidence. And the main mistake I see made in a character evidence analysis is forgetting to think about why this is being introduced. Is this being introduced to show propensity or is this being introduced to show a mimic reason, motive, opportunity, intent, absence of mistake, identity, or common plan or scheme? It's being shown to show any of those mimic reasons, it can probably come in. You just need to run through those two requirements and, and play judge and see, do that balancing test. Can they show it by preponderance of the evidence? If so, it's gonna be allowed to come in. Okay, that's enough on character evidence. Let's move on to the big one, the big bone daddy of, of evidence, which is going to be hearsay. Um, hearsay, <laughs> where to begin? Hearsay is one of those rules. It's not even a rule. The analysis of hearsay encompasses so many different rules and directions to go. I couldn't possibly talk about hearsay you know, in all of the black letter law in this video. That would require, you know, a two hour video discussing every nuance of hearsay. So what I'm gonna try to do is just give you the overview, how to think about what is hearsay and what isn't hearsay. So let's just go with the, the policy behind hearsay, kind of like what we talked about for character evidence. Why do we have hearsay? So if you've ever played telephone as a child, right? We played this in first or second grade. So it's a game that you play when you're, you know, children in a classroom, you may have done this. What happens is the teacher has a statement and they say that, so all these kids in the class sit in a big circle, right, around from each other and the teacher starts with some statement, right? And she whispers that statement to the first kid. And that kid whispers it to the kid sitting next to them, to the kid next to them, and it goes all the way around the circle. And it always gets back to the teacher, and of course it's completely changed. From whatever the statement was originally, when it gets back to the teacher, it's totally different. And I think, you know, that's just because that's probably just human nature, right? It's hard to repeat things exactly, to put words in someone else's mouth. And you can see that with first graders and adults in every walk of life. 
So hearsay is here to prevent that from happening, to prevent that telephone situation from happening. The whole point of hearsay is if you have somebody who's made a statement out of court, we don't want somebody else to testify to what that person said for them. If you have a witness that said something and you want to bring that in to trial, you need to call the person who said it because we don't want somebody else putting words in their mouth form. They might get it wrong. If somebody said something out of court, call the person who said it and bring them to court. That is the whole goal of hearsay. So what is hearsay? The traditional definition of hearsay is going to be hearsay is an out of court statement that is offered to prove the truth of the matter asserted. That's what you're going to want to write on your bar exam. That is what hearsay is. And I like to think about hearsay in terms of three elements. When you're determining what is hearsay, it's an out of court statement that is okay. So three elements, sorry, just jumbled two together. It's an out of court, that's your first element. Statement is element number two, and being offered for the truth of the matter asserted is number three. So let's talk about those one by one. What does it mean to be out of court? Because sounds easy, but I've actually seen this messed up before. Out of court means anything that is out of the four corners of the courtroom that you're currently in right now. Anything that is said outside of that box that is your current courtroom, is out of court. So if it's said in the hall outside the courtroom 10 minutes before proceedings begin, that's out of court. If it's said in a different courtroom six months ago, that's out of court. Anything out of the four corner box of your courtroom is out of court. What is a statement, right? Because it's an out of court statement being offered for the truth of the matter asserted. A statement is a person's oral assertions, written assertions, and nonverbal assertions. Key word here being a person's. It has to be a human being making an assertion. That assertion can be oral, written, or nonverbal. So what if a dog is barking? Is that an out of court statement? It's out of court, most likely. Is it a statement? No, remember, it has to be a human being to be an assertion. For hearsay purposes, a dog barking is not an out of court statement that doesn't fall under hearsay. What about a copier or a faxer that's making machines? Somebody says they heard a fax going off. That is not going to fall under hearsay. That's not a statement. It has to be a person making the statement, which is an assertion. What about somebody nodding their head, right? Is that a statement? Yes, as long as it's a nonverbal assertion, a thumbs up, a head nod, all of that, as long as a person is doing it, can be a statement for hearsay purposes. Remember, anything written, oral or nonverbal, so a letter, an email, if it has assertions in it, statements in it, that is going to fall under out of court statement. The main thing there to remember is it can be oral statements like me talking right now. This is all out of court. I'm making all kinds of assertions here. This would all fall under that umbrella of an out of court statement. If I was writing anything, letters, emails, that's going to fall under it. Um, and obviously, thumbs up, head nods, that's all, that's all good too, as long as it's an assertion. Remember, it has to be a human being, not an object, a machine, an animal, not going to count as an out of court statement. So let's move on to the big part of you, say, which is that third element. So it's an out of court statement that's offered for the truth of the matter asserted. What does that mean? Truth of the matter asserted. It's being offered for the truth of the matter asserted. So fortunately, there's normally four things. There's four examples. There's four out of court statements that are commonly offered that are not for the truth of the matter asserted. These are verbal acts of independent legal significance, statements offered to show the effect on the listener, statements offered to show the mental state of the declarant, and statements offered for impeachment purposes. All of these statements, they could be out of court statements, are being offered, but they're not being offered to show the truth of the matter asserted, so they're not hearsay. So let's look at some examples for each of these. So let's start with verbal acts of independent legal significance. Imagine out of court, 
you have somebody, imagine this for a defamation case, right? Somebody is out of court making defamatory statements about you. They are, you know, shooting their mouth off, out of court, making all kinds of assertions and statements that aren't true about you. And it hurts your reputation, so you sue for defamation. When you get to court for your defamation suit, you're going to want to bring in those defamatory statements that that person said. Even though technically that's an out of court statement, it's not hearsay. They can't object and say that's hearsay. That's a statement that has independent legal significance. It's an actual element of defamation that you have to show that false statements were made. So you have to bring in those statements. It's an act of independent legal significance. You can't sue someone for defamation and then not bring in the statements that, you, that they said. Now, we don't care about the truth of those statements. And that's the theme here with all this. We don't care whether those statements are true or not. We're bringing it in because we have to, because it has independent legal significance. This would be the case for a threat, right? If you're suing someone for assault, they've caused a reasonable apprehension, right, of fear and you're trying to show that they were banging on your door and threatening you or whatever, you don't care if their threats were true or not. That doesn't matter. We're not introducing that out of court statement to show the truth of the matter asserted. We're bringing it in just because it has independent legal significance. This is a threat. It made you feel a reasonable apprehension. That's why you bring it in to prove an element of your case. Not You don't care whether it's true or not. That's verbal act of, ind of independent legal significance. The next example is to show an effect on the listener. So if you and me are standing out in the street and I say, hey, look out, there's a car coming and you jump out of the way to dodge it, right? And we want to bring that into court to show the effect on the listener. We don't care if a car was actually coming or not, but we were bringing in me yelling at you that a car was coming to show the reason why you jumped out, right? We're showing the effect on the listener. We don't care whether or not my statement was true, whether a car was coming or not, that's irrelevant. We're bringing it in to show that you jumped out of the way, right? That was your effect on the listener. Next, you have to show the declarant state of mind. So an out of court statement offered to show the uh, declarant state of mind or mental state. So imagine that there's some guy that's outside and he's telling everybody out, you know, out of court statements that he's the king of England, right? He's just yelling this from the rooftops to everyone. That's his thing. You know, he's the king of England and he really believes it, whatever. He's telling everybody he's the king of England. And then, then somehow this guy ends up being a witness at trial. And we ask him, you know, and, the, and the, the other side wants to ask him about these statements to show his mental state, right? This is an out of court statement, but it's not being offered to show the truth of the matter asserted. We don't care whether or not this guy's the king of England. We're not introducing this statement that he's made to prove whether or not he's the king of England. We don't care about that. We're introducing it to show his mental state. This guy's clearly unstable. This is a crazy person. He's running around telling everyone he's the king of England. That's why we're bringing it in, show he's a crazy person, not to show, you know, to show his mental state, I should, I should say, not to show the truth of the matter asserted. And finally, your last big one you have are impeachment purposes. This is all about attacking the witness's credibility. So if you introduce an out of court statement to attack the witness's credibility, you don't necessarily care whether the statement is true or not. Like this is common with prior inconsistent statements. We don't necessarily care if you're introducing it for impeachment purposes, not substantive purposes. Although there is, you know, certain ways that prior inconsistent statements can come in for substantive purposes, but I'm not going to go into that. But if you're bringing it in, a prior inconsistent statement that was made out of court to say that this person to attack their credibility, you're not bringing it in, even though it's an out of court statement for the truth, right? You don't care whether their statement was true or not. You only care that it's an inconsistent statement, which shows that they may lack credibility. You don't care about the truth of the matter asserted. So if any of those four categories are triggered, you don't have hearsay because that third element isn't met. It's an out of court statement, but it's not being offered for the truth of the matter asserted. So categorically, by definition, those statements are not hearsay, even though they're out of court statements. 
I just want to look out for that. The reason that I'm so specific there is oftentimes I'll see something that is categorically not hearsay and people even recognize that and come to the conclusion that something's not hearsay because it's not offered for the truth of the matter asserted. But then they'll start talking about exceptions to hearsay where it could possibly come in. And this is very wrong. If something is not hearsay, you don't need to discuss any exceptions to the hearsay rule. It's not hearsay. So it doesn't, you don't have to discuss exceptions to the hearsay rule for something that's not hearsay. It's admissible, right? Unless something else is triggered, those things are going to be admissible. They're not hearsay. Um, and those are your main four categories. Otherwise, if you find something that it is hearsay, it meets all three of those criteria. It's out of court, it's a statement, and it's offered for the truth of the matter asserted, then your starting point general rule is going to be it's inadmissible. But obviously we know from our time and evidence in law school that there's a dozen or so exceptions to that rule where even though it is hearsay, the court's still going to allow it to come in. I don't wanna go through all of those exceptions in this video. If you're interested in learning about those, I recommend that you you know, check out the federal rules of evidence. It's gonna lay out those exceptions for you really neatly and do that for free. Or if you want more uh, involved explanations of those exceptions, I always recommend our attack outline, link in the description. Otherwise, guys, I don't wanna go on more than I have to. Those are your three most tested rules and evidence, relevance, character evidence, and hearsay. You wanna make sure that you have those down ice cold in your preparation for the multi-state exam. It's very likely that you're gonna see at least one of those if evidence is tested, if not all of them. Um, and with that, guys, I will leave you to it. I wish you the absolute best of luck in your bar preparation, and I'll see you at our next video.